technical problems. Sorry. OK, we are back. Um, uh, so what we're going to look at is Ypsilanti more or less in the period between 1860 and when is the end of Reconstruction? When is the beginning of Jim Crow? That's, you know, uh, we're still living in the world of both Reconstruction and Jim Crow. So we're still dealing with all of these issues and we're still very much living in the world created by the Civil War. So let's uh, go forward. And the first thing we're going to look at is 1863 Michigan's Colored Men's Convention. Uh, that's the official name of it. And uh, these conventions were extremely important um, to black life before the Civil War. They were there were national conventions and state conventions. Um, black men and black women were um, uh, uh, couldn't participate in politics, uh, even the way that white women could. Uh, you couldn't vote. You couldn't. Um, uh, run for office, you couldn't be on a jury, et cetera, et cetera. So your, your relationship to the United States and to the Civil War is different. And one of the things we see here is in 1863, because of what Ypsilanti is, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, later about that, is that this is a gathering place. And it happens here, if we notice, when does this gathering happen? It happens January 28, 1863. Uh, and so what is the reason for that? Well, January 1st, 1863, the um, Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect. Uh, and we all know that the Emancipation Proclamation is problematic. Uh, we all know that it is... Um, uh, a legal document, a, a document, uh, the necessity of war. It is one of the driest, most uh, legalistic uh, revolutionary proclamations ever given. Um, and one of the things I think is we can dismiss the Emancipation Proclamation as not actually liberating anybody at the time. But I think that would be a mistake because it changes the character of the war. And the most important immediate thing it does is put guns in the hands of black men. And that is a dramatic transformation in this country. And uh, so the raising of black troops immediately raises questions about Will these troops be treated like white troops? Will they have black officers? Will they have white officers? What will their rights be in comparison to white troops? Can you have an army where you have a differentiation of troops? Some troops treated differently than others. That's going to be very problematic, problematic in an army. And then for black men joining or potentially joining the army, do you want to join an army in which in which you can be the leader of your community. You can be Martin Delaney, for example, who was at this meeting, but you can't be an officer. You have to take orders from a 19-year-old farm boy from Sayo County, uh, and you're Martin Delaney. Well, you're not going to accept that. Um, and so the, 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 the impulse to join is uh, and to participate in the war um, uh, is is colored by the character of the war. And what these men are determined to do is change the character of the war. And wars can be many, many different things. The Civil War is many different things. It's many different wars within one large war. And um, while we can say that the Civil War was not fought to free the slaves, these folks would beg to differ. That is why they fought the war. Uh, that is the reason they fought the war, and they are responsible largely for turning that war into an abolition war, as well as um, just uh, black people in the field making the war uh, an abolition war because they're making abolition in their own lives. And so what do black men do when they come to Ypsilanti to discuss the Emancipation Proclamation and the uh, joining uh, the potential for black men to join the Union Army and fight. Well, they make a demand on the United States government, and that demand is to remove the word white from the state constitution, because we cannot fight for the state. At that point, units were raised by state, not nationally. We cannot write white. We cannot fight for this state if it's a white man's state. Uh, and so you see people without rights uh, you know, the, the, 
the, the people uh, uh, um, completely uh, excluded from the political process, making demands on the federal government, on the process itself, to change that process and to be a process of emancipation and liberation. So what, and, and here we know Frederick Douglass's famous quote, this struggle may be a moral one or it may be a physical one and it may be both moral and physical, but a struggle it must be, right? And so these people understood that. The other men you're looking at here, this is George de Baptiste, uh, who was a radical leader of the abolitionist movement and the Order of the Men of Oppression, a, a secret underground revolutionary anti-slavery society in Detroit. And he would be instrumental in organizing Michigan's black troops to go fight in the Civil War. He himself did not, he was a little older in his 40s at this time. This is a younger picture of him. But he would have followed those troops down to South Carolina and participated in, in organizing Michigan. Uh, relief for those troops and et cetera. So he was sort of the patron of black troops uh, from Michigan. And then this man here is William Whipper. You see him here. He's another nationally known figure. So again, and another person who was at this meeting, and you can't, the, the name is cut off at the bottom here, is a man named Osborne Perry Anderson, O.P. Anderson. And O.P. Anderson was the only black survivor of the raid on Harper's Ferry the, of the um, Army of the Provisional Republic of John Brown. Uh, so even that connection, to abolitionism is felt here in Ypsilanti during the Civil War. So regardless of the federal government, regardless of white leadership, regardless of anything else, these men were going to make the Civil War an abolition war and then within that process create a society not based on slavery but a, a rebirth of freedom, a democratic non-racial democracy. Now that didn't happen. Uh, but that was the intention. That was the intention. Okay, so let's define some terms. So Reconstruction is a very specific period in our time. Uh, and uh, Reconstruction, we often think of as just happening in the South, or Reconstruction being something uh, um, uh, 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 sort of a legalistic thing. But Reconstruction, we're talking about in a change, a dramatic transformation in this country. Uh, we're talking about the people who had the most power in this country before the Civil War, the slave owning aristocracy uh, being decimated by the Civil War. We're talking about people who were held in bondage before the Civil War, having the right to vote, or many of them, the right to vote after the Civil War. Major transformation. Also, this is a, a moment where there's an, inc an incredible industrialization in the country, right? And so people are going from farm to factory. And so all of the questions raised by the end of chattel slavery, what is a fair day's wage for a fair day's work? What are, are my rights at work? Um, if we're going to break up those big plantations, why are we not going to break up? Or if it's on the agenda to break up those big plantations, why are we not going to break up the big railroad companies that own all of the land uh, uh, in America. So Reconstruction and the end of chattel slavery raises questions for everybody in this country about not just race, but class, who has power, who doesn't, what the economy looks like, what it looks like to work, what it looks like to be educated, what it looks like to vote, what it looks like to participate in society. So all of those questions are being asked during and after the Civil War. So it's not just the South. Um, uh, during this period of Reconstruction is also the period of the most concentrated uh, uh, um, uh, dispossession of Native people on the plains, right, the 1870s. This is when the Little Bighorn and all of that kind of stuff happens. It is also the largest workers uprising in American history in 1877, uh, in which thousand, potentially thousands of people were killed uh, over that summer and of a, a workers uprising on the railroad tracks. So this was an incredibly violent, confrontational period that was not confined to the South. Um, if anybody watches old Westerns, that's the period we're looking at, where sort of law is the gun. Uh, and you can imagine half of the country was under arms and killing each other for five years. And you have 
not just um, uh, these demobilized armies and, and people having that. You have a traumatized country. You have a country that had three quarters of a million people die in five years, right? So, so in part, re Reconstruction is dealing with the political social trauma of the last period as well. So all of these ideas, land, labor, race, rights, citizenship, are coming into, into discussion. We have the white reaction to the victories, and we must say they were victories because that's the people died for those things, the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments, but not just those legal amendments, the, the, the social uh, uh, changes that allowed for those amendments uh, and the suppression of the white reactionary South that allowed for those amendments. We should not forget that the most democratic period in American history, and Du Bois talks about this in his Black Reconstruction, uh, largely meant that uh, uh, white power, especially in the South, was, um, was physically pushed down. That's what it required to have democracy in this country. It required a military dictatorship in the South. So sometimes we think democracy versus dictatorship. Well, the Civil War raises all kinds of questions about what is a democracy, uh, who all of the, what is a dictatorship? Is it a dictatorship for the US military to enforce the rights of black people in South Carolina? Well, you would only think that is a dictatorship if you were a white person in South Carolina. If you were a black person in South Carolina, that would be a defense for your freedoms, not a dictatorship, right? So, so these questions are fraught with difficulties, fraught with difficulties. Uh, we, we get that severe white racist reaction, the redeemer. We are still living with that white racist reaction to the gains of the Civil War. So much of our public debate today uh, comes from these questions that were asked then. So at the same time, you've got uh, uh, white uh, reactionaries organizing things like the Ku Klux Klan and the White Leagues and putting out this platform. So you see that it is very clear uh, that the 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 race the racist reaction to the Civil War was a racist reaction to the Civil War. That it was a reaction to white power losing uh, some of its position in the South. Um, so, but at the same time that uh, white um, reactionaries are organizing, um, black people are organizing as well. You have to remember that black people have been organized into the army into a kind of a discipline, into um, a relationship with people that they had never known before, a national institution in which they were part of and which they had rights in. And so you get many of the leaders of Black Reconstruction, of Recon the Reconstruction Movement coming out of the USCTs um, uh, and coming out of that Civil War experience. And they will create their own organizations, their benevolent societies, mutual aid societies. Uh, and then there's something called the Freedmen's Bureau, which is the first, it is the first uh, attempt by the federal government to intervene to, to help individual lives on a mass scale, right? Uh, so when we think of uh, black liberation and the things like the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments and those victories that we associate with the destruction of slavery and the liberation or potential liberation of black people after the civil war, almost every one of those acts liberates many more people than just black people, right? So public, uh, education demanded by black people. Now, if you're poor and white in Mississippi, you get to read for the first time. You get to learn for the first time. Uh, that is a process of reconstruction. The 14th Amendment, most of the our civil rights movement after that for gay rights, for women's rights is based on the 14th of Amendment of equal protection under the law. The 14th Amendment is also the most democratic, it is the most democratic um, jump, legal jump this country ever made uh, because what it defines is citizenship. Before a citizen was, you know, uh, sort of defined willy-nilly. I mean, there was, there was, there was no guarantee of anybody becoming a citizen unless you were sort of a white man in the United States. But the 14th Amendment says anybody born here 
it doesn't matter where your parents were, it doesn't matter who your parents were, anybody born in this country has full citizenship rights. And so when you hear, for example, recently, members of the Republican Party talking about overturning the 14th Amendment, that is the most dangerous consequence of a, of a, of a fight against Reconstruction we have had since Reconstruction right? Uh, because the biggest gain, legal gain, just legal gain of Reconstruction was the 14th Amendment. The 15th Amendment gives Black men the right to vote. Uh, uh, and that's, uh, so uh, think of that. 10 years earlier, the Supreme Court said that white men had, the Black men had no rights that white men were bound to recognize. None, zero. In 1857, the Supreme Court Supreme Court said that within 10 years, black men have won, fought and won for the right to vote. So this was a revolution. This was an absolute transformation in who had power in society. Uh, it was a revolution in, in the institutions of society, in the way people work. It was a revolution. And revolutions are always messy, complicated business. Uh, we have terms like scalawags, carpetbaggers, and jayhawks. And when I was growing up, scalawags and carpetbaggers were ter just terms of terrible abuse. So what is a scalawag? A scalawag is a, um, a Southerner who supports Reconstruction, a white Southerner who supports Reconstruction. Carpetbagger is um, a Black or white person who goes South to help Reconstruction. They might have even been born in slavery in the South, like H.P. Jacobs, and gone back uh, to support Reconstruction, but they would be called carpetbaggers. And Jayhawks would be uh, um, people in Kansas who fought against uh, bushwhackers from Missouri. But a Jayhawk was a way to say sort of a rough anti-slavery person, like a bushwhacker was a way to, way to say a rough uh, pro-slavery person. So the Jayhawks were, were um, um, tough people, tough people, sort of frontier people, but anti-slavery people. They were largely white. Then we have different periods of Reconstruction. We have presidential Reconstruction, which is the first phase of Reconstruction, which happens under Andrew Johnson, who did not want to reconstruct the society. We have military Reconstruction, which happened under that dictatorship. And then we have radical Reconstruction, in which the radical wing of the Republican Party, not our radical wing of the Republican Party, a very different radical wing of the Republican Party, a pro-Black, pro-Reconstruction um, uh, wing, uh, fought with Andrew Johnson to take over Reconstruction in the South. Uh, and that's the most radical democratic moment in American history. Uh, is So it's not now, it's not during the Civil Rights Movement. If I were to define the most radical democratic moment, and not because of the rights people had, but the potential to gain new rights, it would be Reconstruction. So even though women did not have the right to vote in Reconstruction. The horizon for rights opened by Reconstruction uh, uh, made people demand women's rights, right? And, and so, so Reconstruction was an incredibly democratic period. Again, fraught with all kinds of complications. We also have Black Codes, the natural, National Civil Rights Acts of 1866 and 75. We'll look more at that. Michigan's Constitution and Civil Rights Acts. A lot of this is based in, in legal framing, right? Because I think it's important to remember, why, why are there so many acts and so many laws uh, that are required by Reconstruction? Well, that's because so many laws of this country uh, were put in place to codify slavery. Um, it wasn't a Southern institution, it's a national institution. So, so many of our laws and so much of our uh, the ways of doing business uh, in government were based on slave power and the protection of slavery. And so re it requires changing many, many, many laws. That's why we talk about legal reconstruction. But I think it's important to remember those that legal framework is happening in the context of a social fight, of a political fight, uh, just like you know, the Civil Rights Act in 1864 only happened in the context of the uh, sitting in in Birmingham and those those kinds of things. I think that's important to remember when we're talking about legal reconstruction. It is the uh, outcome of this social struggle. This social struggle. Okay, so let's move forward.
Okay, so let's just briefly look at the community uh, here before the Civil War. I think that's important to look before and after. Um, uh, people are probably familiar with this. About 10% of Detroit was enslaved through much of the 18th century. Um, so again, slavery is a national reality. Michigan becomes a state in 1837 only when Arkansas can become a state. So the fact that Michigan gets to join the Union is determined on a slave state joining the Union, Arkansas. Uh, Ypsilanti is settled largely by New Yorkers. Uh, so upstate New York too, not New York City. New York City had a very strong relationship, a mercantile and financial relationship with slavery. But Northern New York is one of those places in the United States. It certainly had black people, it certainly had slavery, but it was one of the places where slavery probably had the least sort of impact on the daily, on the economy and lives of people. It was also the place um, where there was a, a religious revival movement, several religious revival movements called the Great Awakenings, based largely in the Methodist Baptist uh, uh, traditions. Uh, and though that Great Awakening, and uh, it's not a coincidence that early Black congregations often come from African Methodist or Methodist traditions or Baptist traditions where that Great Awakening was happening. Uh, but that meant that, that questions like slavery like abolition, were being asked at, uh, in Ypsilanti. It doesn't mean that people were answering with an affirmative, of course, we want to abolish slavery. It does mean that uh, unlike in some other communities, uh, Ypsilanti, it was an open question. It was not a done question. Uh, there's a socially active community around the normal college here, including many women. So we have many middle-class white women in Ypsilanti um, with no political rights and, and people large without, a, without rights, but with education, largely ask for rights. So, so uh, we do have a kind of progressive community within Ypsilanti. That doesn't mean Ypsilanti is a progressive community. It's not. In, in fact, it will vote pretty consistently for uh, Democrats during and after the Civil War. It will not vote for Lincoln's reelection in 1864. White abolitionists are a teeny small minority in Ypsilanti. So the Liberty Party won 23 votes in 1844. This will be one of the first votes that I would have been allowed to vote in because I don't own property in Ypsilanti, but I would have been able to vote in this vote. So even, even some white men in, in Michigan had uh, problems uh, voting, at least in local elections, um, uh, until um, the 1840s. And then, of course, we have had property qualifications uh, in Ypsilanti for school board elections until the 1950s. Um, so there, uh, the Liberty Party only got 23 votes. Now, again, that's only white men over 21 with certain qualifications who can vote, but that's still in Ypsilanti, that's about 3% of the vote. So when we think of Ypsilanti as a abolitionist hotbed, no, it wasn't. <laughs> no, it wasn't, not even remotely. Uh, Ralph Nader would have gotten more votes in 2000 than abolitionists would have gotten votes in Ypsilanti. Uh, um, the first noted segregation in the city, and, and, and there's going to be noted segregation, is all the way back in the 1840s, and it's in the original city cemetery, which is now Prospect Park. In the 1850s, Ypsilanti's population, Black population, triples. And that is because of the Fugitive Slave Act, uh, which means that Ohio, or in any place sort of north of the Ohio River, which you might have found a modicum of refuge uh, before 1850 now becomes off limits. The federal government will come in and force the states to return you to the person who owns you. So uh, Canada is the only place where um, uh, uh, there's a modicum of freedom available and we are very close to Canada. So the combination of the normal school and a, and a couple of early black families moving here with our geography means that Ypsilanti explodes in a black population population. And Ypsilanti will have the largest Black population of any city in Michigan between the Civil War and uh, by percentage uh, uh, and about World War I. Uh, and so you notice here, here's a group of refuge, refugee settlers in Windsor, Ontario. So these are the people who escaped from slavery and settled into Canada. And that is what Ypsilanti's community is. My guess is, in fact, these people are related to Ypsilantians. It's, it would be surprising that they weren't. Okay, um, 
rights before reconstruction. So Ypsilanti had black codes. What were black codes? They were state laws which governed the activities and abilities of black people to live in those states. So many northern states which didn't have slavery had black codes. Uh, and so states like Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and the codes were different from state to state, but let's say Illinois uh, would require, if you were a black person, free, never been enslaved, anything like that, if you wanted to move to Illinois, you, there were black codes, which meant that you would have to put up $500 surety, have three white men sign that you were a good person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so Michigan did have those black codes in 1827. Uh, we have a small number of enslaved people still in Michigan up through the 1830s. In, on August 1st, 1834, a monumental thing happens, at least in this part of the world, and that is uh, slavery is ended with a couple of large caveats like India in the British Empire, which means that Canada is now the place for, for freedom. And it means that this republic uh, is less free than uh, King George's monarchy, which was not uh, lost on many abolitionists, many abolitionists. Um, so that slavery being outlawed right next door, you have then you have a, a literal uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you have a literal retort to American slavery physically within within 30 miles of us, right? And that changes some of the character of the fight against slavery, but it also means that black people have refuge communities, not refugee communities, refuge communities in Canada in which to organize the struggle against slavery in the United States. So many of these communities in Canada act as sort of revolutionary outposts of the anti-slavery struggle in which people are going back and forth, back and forth. When John Brown is organizing his raid on Harper's Ferry, he goes goes to Canada, to Chatham. He meets with this remarkable man right here, William Lambert. Uh, uh, so when, when Brown is organizing the Provisional Army to go to Harper's Ferry, where does he come for troops, uh, Black troops? He comes to the Detroit area. That's exactly where he comes because this organization has already happened here. So remember in 1863 how uh, we talked about uh, Black Ypsilantians demanding that the word white be removed from it? Well, 20 years even before that, William Lambert, when the first Michigan Constitution was being ratified, went to Lansing uh, within, what is that, within six years of, of Michigan becoming a state to demand that uh, Michigan also drop the word white from its constitution. So there has never not been a civil rights movement in Ypsilanti. There, is, there have been black people demanding full freedom uh, 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 in this area um, uh, ever since there have been Black people here. Uh, interesting, too, within this area, so you have people like William Lambert demanding freedom in this country, but also people by the 1850s were giving up on this country and thinking about going to Africa. Uh, and so William uh, or Martin Delaney is organizing to the Liberian expedition uh, uh, to go to Africa, and this man's this is Asher Ray up here, and Asher Ray's nephew will be one of the men uh, who will join with um, uh, Martin Delaney to go to Africa. So we also have a uh, an emigrationist, a people who are fed up. Now it's very different than the white emigrationists who want to remove black people from the United States. These are black emigrationists who want to return on their own terms to Africa. Uh, uh, and so we have both of those kind of communities living in Canada and arguing with each other and having different meetings and all of that kind of stuff. So remember, this is a very politically active community that has been having discussions about what to do about slavery for decades, generations before the Civil War. They're bringing those discussions into the Civil War. So we talked about the 18th Fugitive Slave Act, 1857 is the Dred Scott decision. Uh, which is that decision that we talked about, which said uh, uh, that uh, uh, black men had no rights, literally that white men were bound to respect. And Ypsilanti is closely, closely connected to that story. In fact, the, the Ypsilanti's most important connection to the entire story of slavery and the fight against is probably our connection, our connection, uh, Ypsilanti's connection to Lyman Norris, 
uh, we, Norris Street, Norris Avenue in Ypsilanti. He was the congressperson from here. He's the son of Mark and Rosina Norris, who were pioneers and founders of Depot Town and wealthy landowners here in Ypsilanti. And um, they were emigrationists, meaning they were against slavery because they didn't believe that black people should be in the United States at all. So sometimes you'll read in history books that the Norrises were anti-slavery. They weren't. They were uh, anti-black and black people were slavery required black people. But their son, Lyman Norris, became ideologically pro-slavery. And he became a, a leading Democrat. He actually moved from Ypsilanti to St. Louis, Missouri to edit a pro-slavery paper. He was a, a lawyer in Missouri and he became the lead lawyer for the family who owned Dred Scott the uh, slave owners who owned Dred Scott and argued the Dred Scott case to the M Missouri S Supreme Court, which let it then go to the uh, United States Supreme Court. And this man was elected during Reconstruction as uh, Ypsilanti's congressperson. So that the majority of Ypsilanti elected a person closely associated not with abolition, but with slavery as Congress during Reconstruction here. Okay, so here is the 15th Amendment celebrating. And again, the 15th Amendment is, get, is uh, black men winning the right to vote. And while this uh, image here, I believe is from Baltimore, uh, it's not from Ypsilanti, but if you read the report about the 15th Amendment um, being uh, celebrated here in Ypsilanti, it's very much like this. It looks very much like this. Um, and so we have here, uh, I want to just read a little bit of this. So people are meeting at Hewitt Hall, which is where the mix is today. Um, and uh, the president of the day is a man named Mr. Carter. So William Carter was a um, a sergeant, a black sergeant in the uh, 102nd United States Color Troops. And the uh, opening speech is uh, a speech given by John Wesley Brooks. And uh, 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 Brooks was a lay preacher. Uh, he actually owned quite a bit of land early in his life in Pittsfield Township uh, and was a delegate to those early colored men's conventions. So this is um, uh, a, a, a figure who has been active in Ypsilanti area, Washtenaw County, since the very beginning of Washtenaw County as a black man going to these colored men's conventions, raising these issues. So when black men finally give the right to vote, uh, uh, John Wesley Brooks is uh, uh, given the honor of, of opening the celebration. And then the celebration goes through Ypsilanti, and we can see the people here, the Grand Marshals, the President, and it will stop in front of uh, Lyman Decatur Norris's law offices. Uh, uh, first, it'll stop in front of the Radical Republican newspaper, The Commercial, to give three cheers. Then to River Street and onto Huron Street, uh, halted in front of the residence of S.M. Cutchen, gave three cheers and three cheers in front of uh, Sam Post store, who had a national flag floating in the breeze. Uh, we ought not to admit S.H. Wells, so Sanford Wells' speech. Sanford Wells was a, a, a barber, a local black barber, a leading member of Ypsilanti's Black community and a veteran of the 55th Massachusetts Infantry. And they get to Lyman Decatur Norris's office. And uh, Mr. Wells said, uh, we praise God for giving us Abraham Lincoln. Christ, I remember this is recently after Lincoln was assassinated and he was not assassinated because he was uh, uh, um, soft on slavery. He was assassinated because the South thought he was far, far too hard on the South. Now. I have my own opinion about that, but John Wilkes Booth had his. Um, so Christ died uh, for all, Lincoln died for his country, and John Brown died for the slaves. This is what uh, uh, Wells is saying. He said, uh, now we, and to, uh, now we uh, are fulfilled. Ethiopia is stretching out her hand to God. No party is able to swallow the Negro but the Republicans, meaning that the, Demo the Democrats uh, uh, have lost this powerful voting bloc, which will control the government now. So people, again, going from no power to associated with the most powerful political party in the country. Uh, uh, and he says, um, uh, the curly hair doesn't seem to tickle their throats now, does it? 
Uh, and it's uh, the, not long since a Democratic con candidate for Congress said that we had no rights he was bound to respect. He dare not say that now. To Lyman Decatur Norris's face, they are saying that uh, in the streets, not in private, in the streets, uh, as he's going to be congressperson. So that is, uh, I think that gives you a good example of the um, um, confidence of this community after the Civil War. Okay, legal reconstruction in Michigan, and I know I have to speed up a little bit here. So this is the legal changes that need to have to happen in Michigan for black people to have rights. And there are, again, these legal changes only happen because people are struggling socially in all kinds of different ways, right? These are not coming from on high, they're being pushed from below, they're being pushed from below. So in 1863, Michigan, itself authorizes the provision in the Emancipation Proclamation uh, to raise black troops. So Michigan, you know, and that was a debate. <laughs> it was a debate. Now, Michigan decides to do it, but they decide not to do it. So they decide to do it in theory, but not to do it in reality. And that means many black men who wanted to join here will go on to join the 54th and 55th Massachusetts. So that's why we see so many black men in March, April, May go to Massachusetts because of the reticence of Michigan to fulfill its obligations. In 1866, in 1866, a bill on women's suffrage, because this is what reconstruction in the Civil War has opened. Nobody was talking, I mean, I think it would have been very hard to get, um, uh, a vote on women's suffrage to the Michigan Senate before the Civil War. But immediately after, it gets to the Michigan Senate. Now, it's defeated only by one vote, um, and we'll have to go through a long period before another, what, 50 or so years before Michigan will um, uh, uh, vote for women's suffrage. But so, uh, again, 50 year, it takes 50 years to achieve the promise of reconstruction. That's how radical reconstruction is. In 1867, state legis prohibits segregation of Michigan schools. So we have an anti-segregation clause going back to the 1860s here. In theory, no Michigan school should ever have been before, ap after 1867, should ever have been segregated. Now, Anybody who went to Michigan schools went to a segregated school. So something didn't want work out there. But legally, legally, uh, you had the basis to fight segregation of Michigan schools. In 1867, a new constitution was put forward with black suffrage in it. So this is before the 15th Amendment nationally. So this is sort of a 15th Amendment on a statewide level. That fails. That fails. Um, the first black man elected. Uh, in post-reconstruction period, I think probably the first black man elected. People were appointed before to certain positions, but not, I don't think, elected. Uh, but in 1868, Dawson Pompey is elected to Covert Township Road Commission. That is your first black elected person I know of in Michigan. In 1869, the Workmen versus Board of Education. This is, again, um, uh, of the legal precedence where because Detroit is resisting, the, the city of Detroit is officially resisting uh, de, uh, the lack of segregation in public education. So there's these laws going through, um, uh, uh, the, through the Constitution and stuff like that. In 1869, Michigan's constitutional uh, amendment for black male suffrage passes 54,105 to 50,598 in a referendum and the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments are uh, ratified in Michigan. So that means black men could vote in Mississippi before they could vote in Michigan. Black men could vote in Mississippi before they could vote in Michigan. In 1870, the Michigan State uh, Women's Suffrage Association is formed in Battle Creek. Battle Creek is also a center of the abolitionist movement. In many ways, the women's suffrage movement is both part of and an outgrowth of the abolition movement, as well as being its own movement. But it's at least in, in the period of the Civil War, pre-Civil War, Civil War and Reconstruction, women's suffrage and anti-slavery are very, very closely connected ideologically and politically. What we will see when that breaks down is a larger breakdown in the alliance between progressive white people 
and black people in this country. Uh, in 1872, Sojourner Truth is turned away when she attempted to vote in Battle Creek. So people said that the the these amendments, the 14th, I don't think they actually mentioned men by name. So uh, women tried to vote. And I know that in Ypsilanti, women also tried to vote in the 1872 election and were turned away. I believe that um, Helen McAndrew tried to vote in Ypsilanti in 1872 and, and was turned away. Uh, uh, so so again reconstruction there's it's not just the south it's about women's rights not just black women's rights all women's rights it's about labor rights it's about rights of native americans it's about imperialism and our relationship with the with mexico and all, all kinds of questions are coming up in reconstruction um uh in 1874 a referendum on women's suffrage and you know I wonder if we had a referendum on women's suffrage with women up being allowed to vote. Seems a little bit weird to have a, a referendum on women's suffrage where women aren't allowed to vote. I mean, but so the men of Michigan, and this would include black men who are allowed to vote by 1874 in Michigan, 135,900. So wiped out. Michigan, women's suffrage is really wiped out. And I think it's important to women's suffrage only lost in 1866 in the Michigan Senate by one vote, but in the national vote in 18, or in the state vote in 1874, it loses four to one, five to one. And so what we're seeing here is a couple of different things. One, we're seeing a difference between the radical political leadership of the country thrown up by the Civil War and the more conservative population of the country. Uh, and then two, we're seeing the the ebb of the revolutionary wave that was cresting in 1869 and by the mid 1870s is crashing on the beach. Um, so, but in 1875, women in Michigan win the right to vote in school elections, and that includes uh, black women with property. Ypsilanti has property requirements in that. So I don't know how many black women owned property as themselves in Ypsilanti in that period, but. I can imagine it would be a, a relatively small number uh, would have been allowed to vote. And again, only for school board elections. In 1883, Michigan removes the ban on interracial marriage and retroactively legitimizes previous marriages. I have done the work looking at interracial marriages in Ypsilanti, and I looked at both 1870 and 1940, and there were more interracial marriages in 1870 than 1940 not more as a percentage. I mean, even though Ypsilanti was 10,000 people in 1870 and 20,000 people in 1940, there were more in 1870 than in 1940. So uh, again, I think that sometimes we think that things were really, really bad with segregation and we've been making them better and better. No, things were Things were less segregated, at least in Ypsilanti during the Civil War than they are now. Certainly where people lived is less segregated. And then in 1883, the federal Supreme Court will uh, strike down the 1875 Civil Rights Act. So this radical Civil Rights Act was struck down by the Supreme Court in 1883, and it would be 1964, more or less, when this act was retrieved. But in Michigan, there will be a state act. So let's look at a couple of post-war first, because you know, when even when I was growing up, you heard first black, say governor, blank since reconstruction, first black, blank since reconstruction. You heard that all the time. Uh, and that meant two things. One, reconstruction was a moment of, of more democracy for black people. And two, it got destroyed and we haven't had that since, right? So it, that's what people were saying. I mean, and I think that was a profound, that's a profound thing to say. Our first black governor since reconstruction. Well, reconstruction was 150 years ago. So I'm not sure how much, how much progress we have made. Uh, also first, I have problems with first because sometimes firsts are just an accident. Sometimes the first person who does something didn't do it for any other reason than they fell into it. And sometimes the second person who did the thing is far more important than the first. So, and we want, and also it's a competition. Who's first? As if, you know, the first person gets a prize, nobody gets a prize in this. But, um, but you know, firsts in terms of 
we are changing the way we're relating and we're changing roles in society. So that's why those firsts are important because they're indicative of a transformation of society. Sometimes we say the first this and that, and it's actually indicative not of a transformation of the society. So the first black woman astronaut, well, that she's also the last black woman astronaut. So what, you know, what does it mean to say the first black woman astronaut if there's just one? right? Uh, it doesn't say a whole lot. Um, and I don't know if there are more Black women astronauts than that. I'm using that as an example. But so I think sometimes we use firsts in a really problematic way. But uh, it is important um, uh, to, to think about the changes that are happening. So look at how these changes happen. They drips and drabs and uh, 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 around the main issue. According to the decision of the Supreme Court, Persons with less than one quarter African blood in their veins are white men and voters. Let such persons be sure to register and vote. I don't know how you would tell one quarter African blood and you'd like, what is the test for that? I have no idea <laughs> um, because African blood doesn't look any different than anybody else's blood, but you get my point. Uh, uh, we have a one drop rule in this country and there talking they're talking about that one drop rule uh poll, poll raising the colored people of art and a poll was um uh, a campaign poll it was like a totem that you would put up in parks or something like that with ribbons and flags and banners hanging off of it, it says poll raising the colored people of our city proposed to raise a poll on monday afternoon at five o'clock in honor of grant and the memory of the great emancipator Ab abraham lincoln near the west public square so the west public square today is where owen business school is so just west of the library there there were two public squares now and grant was considered um a, a radical grant uh supported black civil rights grant put the u.s army into the south to fight the Klan. the first time that happened since well i think eisenhower put federal troops in in the 50s but that's the so the first time federal troops were put in to fight the Klan. the last time they were put in to fight the Klan was Grant. And so in the South, you have things called the Union Leagues, which are radical black sort of paramilitary voting organizations to defend the community, to um, push forward rights, to defend radical reconstruction. In the North, those organizations were, were often called Grant Clubs. Uh, and uh, in Ypsilanti, there are several Grant Clubs, and Sojourner Truth would have come to Ypsilanti to speak at the Grant Club meeting at the old uh, First Ward School. So such a club was organized in the City Hall Thursday last night. Look here, remember the poll raising we had before? Our poll was cut down by the Ypsilanti Ku Klux Klan. Rejuvenated, taller, and better but will be raised this evening, 6 p.m. Rally Freeman, turnout tanners. So what are tanners? Tanners are workers. It's saying turn out working class people against this clan. So it's that it is that um, radical, um, radical um, uh, alliances that were formed in the Civil War. This is a this is a a reference to that. Um, and so it's also should be noted, Ipsy has a Ku Klux Klan in 1867. That's three weeks after the Klan is founded. That means people in Ypsilanti are clearly clued in to what's going on <laughs> with white reaction to the South. I mean, it's even if they're not really the Klan up here and they're sort of aping the Southern Klan, they're doing it immediately uh, when the Klan is formed in the South. So there's clearly a well of pro-Southern support in Ypsilanti, right? There's clearly that. Now, is it a majority here? No, but it is real here. Uh, uh, S.H. Wells, remember him? He's the, the barber. The colored juror from Ypsilanti served for the first time on circuit court Tuesday last in the cut. So if you were, uh, black men served on juries in the 18, late 1860s in Ypsilanti. Black men would not serve on juries again in Washtenaw County until the late 1930s. And then look at this. Color jury, a colored man committed a brutal indignity upon the daughter and honor of our colored sit on of an honored colored citizen, S. H. Wells. Remember, he's the barber. Upon complaint, he was arrested and brought before Justice Van Cleve. A jury composed of colored citizens exclusively was called, and the offender was summarily dealt with. Such a jury is something new here. 
It is a legitimate result of the 15th Amendment. Henceforth, juries composed in whole or in part of this class of our fellow citizens will be of a common occurrence. A jury, uh, a jury of your peers. Now, if the accused had been a white man, I guarantee <laughs> there would not have been a jury of all black people. So, you know, an all black jury just means for an all, a, a case in which all the defendant and, and everybody is black, right? But how remarkable in a situation where 10 years earlier, black people had no ability to even have recourse to the law, let alone sit on the jury, right? Okay, H.P. Jacobs. So uh, we're, uh, I hope um, Professor Eggy is on the call tonight, but we're, we'll be giving a, a uh, near Martin Luther King Day, we'll be giving a presentation at Eastern Michigan University on H.P. Jacobs, and we will have folks from Jackson State there. Uh, so if you're able to make that, do make that. I think that'll be a wonderful meeting. So who is H.P. Jacobs? H.P. Jacobs is, in my opinion, the most important black man, well, the most important man, most important woman, most important person, black or white man or woman, to have ever lived in Ypsilanti. Uh, he is a major reconstruction leader nationally, but specifically in, in the state of Mississippi. He was born enslaved in St. Clair County, Alabama. Uh, his enslaved name was Samuel Hawkins, Samuel Hawkins. Uh, he was probably the, um, the son of an enslaved woman named, well, he was certainly the son of an enslaved woman, Mary Dill, and probably his father was um, a white man connected with the Dill family. So either the patron, the foreman, something like that. Uh, we know that H.P. Jacobs writes on his Freedman Bureau paper, his mother's name, Mary Dill, and father, he puts dead. So he knows who it is. Uh, he's just not saying. Um, uh, but uh, he, um, he is about 30 years old. He's learned to read and write, and I can't go into his whole story here, but he's learned how to read and write while enslaved on the Dill Plantation. He's married. He has children. So he's part of a, and his mother lives on the same plantation. Uh, and in 1856, he escapes. He writes his own, he's learned how to read and write. What a remarkable thing. Uh, and he's used that as a weapon of freedom, and he's forged his own freedom papers, and he's forged the freedom papers for his wife, he's forged the freedom papers for his daughters, and for his wife's brothers. They steal or take or liberate the masters, uh, the Dill family's cart and horses, buggy and horses, and they make it from St. Clair, Alabama, to the Detroit River in less than three weeks, which is remarkable. At the Detroit River, H.P. Uh, Jacobs, as he writes, uh, sheds his slave name and takes the name H.P. Jacobs. He's baptized in the river. Uh, and H.P. Uh, uh, Jacobs, Jacobs, I've always wondered what that was. His wife's name was Louise Jacobs. He is taking his wife's name. And Louise Jacobs was, um, she dies young, so we don't know, and she's a black woman, so we don't know much about her in the in the historical record, but she is certainly a partner of all of his labors, and uh, I think probably should be considered a co-founder a, a co of many of the things he did while she was still alive. Um, he uh, is, I don't know exactly how he gets, gets to Ypsilanti or why. We know he was in Canada, but we know he gets to Ypsilanti. I would love to know that. But he's he is becomes the janitor at Eastern Michigan University, where he enrolls his daughters into the music conservancy, which will be the first Black girls, first Black people to graduate from what is now Eastern Michigan University. He becomes the uh, janitor at uh, what is now Eastern Michigan University. And the janitor at Eastern Michigan University was the best job a black man could get in Ypsilanti. You lived on campus, you had a regular salary, you worked for a, a highly valued and prized state institution. It, you know, imagine the leading uh, white member of Ypsilanti being a janitor. It's inconceivable that white Ypsilanti would have a working class person as its leader or as its perceived leader um, uh, in this period. And yet in the black community, because of these class differences in the way class and race works, the janitor is the is can become the main leader of the community. That means you're also bringing a class perspective that 
the leaders of that Lyman Norris, the leader of the white community, simply doesn't have. Uh, while here, he's a founder of Second Baptist Church. So he, 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 along with several other people, will become the first pastor. Uh, there are lay people, but he's the person who will purchase the, the building for Second Baptist Church, it would actually be where own business college is, and then would move over to High Street. And then later in the 1870s, it would move down to Catherine and Hamilton, where it is today. Uh, he also founded local black schools here. It led the campaign to get black teachers and black uh, um, pr um, uh, uh, principals uh, because uh, black students could go to white Ypsilanti schools but had to sit in the last two rows. And H.P. Jacobs did not come here from Alabama to have his daughters sit in the last two rows. So always the first demand is full uh, participation into institutions, and that's always denied. And the second demand is always the most self-determination and most um, um, authority we can have over our own institutions as possible. Segregation is both white people uh, uh, removing black people from their institutions, and it's also white people or black people creating non-racist institutions of their own so they don't have to deal with the daily humiliation of going to a white school, et cetera, et cetera. So segregation is also a reaction to racism, not just the, the um, cause of racism. And if we want to desegregate, we also we can't do that without doing the causes of segregation, which made black people remove themselves from white racist institutions, as well as being removed from white racist institutions. So segregation is also a mechanism of defense. And uh, I think we need to realize that. Desegregation in Ypsilanti destroyed the black business district. It did not create new black businesses. It destroyed the black di business district. Because what we're talking about is uh, uh, segregation is a product of a racist society, not the cause of it, not the cause of it. Uh, of course, they interact on each other and codify each other. OK, um, but he goes immediately down to not immediately, but after you know he participates in the 1863 uh, Colored Men's Convention here in Ypsilanti, and he will go down to Natchez, Mississippi, which is in Adams County, Mississippi, which uh, even after the Civil War had a percentage population about 90 percent black. Um, and so it was a place where during Reconstruction, black political power could flower, right? Uh, Natchez is a place where it, if there was real democracy, literally every elected official more or less would have been black, right? Uh, and so um, H.P. Jacobs goes down to Natchez, Mississippi as part of Reconstruction. So he's a carpet bagger, even though he's from Alabama. Uh, he will go down to there and uh, he uh, immediately begins setting up a school. Uh, that school is called the Natchez Seminary. Here it is on your upper left. Uh, and his wife and daughters will become teachers at that school, even though his daughters are in their very early teens at that point. They're educated here at the normal college. Today, the Natchez Seminary is known as Jackson State University. So the founder of Jackson State University was the janitor at Eastern Michigan University. Again, let me say that. The founder of Jackson State University, one of the most important uh, institutions of black higher education in this country's history was founded by the janitor at Eastern Michigan University. Um, he became, he was elected three times to as Mississippi State Senator. He was elected to Natchez City Council and he was elected sheriff. So the man who escaped from slavery in St. Clair, Alabama is elected sheriff of Natchez, Mississippi before the end of the 1870s. A revolution has happened in this country to allow for that to happen. So he helps to rewrite the Mississippi State Constitution, uh, the first, the first pro or post-slavery constitution. And he puts two important, uh, he fights to put two important elements into that constitution. The first element is free publicly funded education for everybody up to a certain age. Uh, again, most of 
certainly almost all of the South and much of the United States did not have public education before the Civil War. It required black demands for public education and reconstruction to allow white people, poor white people to have access to education in large parts of this country. Black liberation tends to liberate everyone. Black liberation tends to lift everyone, including poor white people, especially poor white people in some ways, especially poor white people. In some ways. Uh, uh, the other thing he does is an extremely important uh, uh, addendum or amendum to the Constitution, which um, makes it impossible for you to be jailed for being in debt. Because remember, after the Civil War, OK, you are free. You have no money. You will work for me to pay off your debt and then you get enslaved again. So uh, many people were re-enslaved after the Civil War on the basis of debt they owed to their masters. And so he made that legally, at least, legally not possible. He also set up the Jacobs Benevolence Association, whereby uh, former sla enslaved people would pull their resources and collectively buy and collectively own former plantations. Uh, that didn't work out well. Uh, the, the breaking up of the land, which was the most necessary, the 40 acres and a mule that Du Bois and many other people talk about, that most necessary element of reconstruction did not happen. Uh, and, uh, and in some ways that allowed the white reactionaries, the political space and the, the political power based on their land to come back. Uh, if we had broken up those big plantations the way the radicals like H.P. Jacobs, the way Thaddeus Stevens had wanted to, it would have been much, much harder uh, and we would not have had a sharing cropping system, et cetera, et cetera. So Reconstruction, uh, if I were to say the one great failure of Reconstruction that allows for so many of the other failures that came afterwards, it is that question of land and not breaking up the plantations uh, and not having, and Black people still living as, as tenants, uh, not owning land, not having ownership, whether collective or individually, of land. That, to me, is the key mistake that we're all paying for and will pay for for a very, very long time. Uh, uh, he also offered bills on debt, education, crime. He organized the Mississippi Baptist Convention, which means that, you know, after the end of the Civil War, there were certainly uh, many churches or congregations within enslaved life. But now after the Civil War, those congregations and churches can become official, can become legitimate, have their own institutions, and they will be completely black controlled institutions, right? The black church is the only completely, and completely, I mean, within the context of a racist society where resources are limited, so it's not complete. But the black church is the place where black people have real power over an institution. Uh, and you, you can see how that happens in this process. Uh, he is a rival to John R. Lynch. So there is a black, there's a rivalry between black leaders of reconstruction in Mississippi. Uh, John R. Lynch uh, versus H.P. Jacobs. A, John R. Lynch is allied with um, Southern scalawags and H.P. Jacobs is allied with Northern carpetbaggers. It's hard. There's a, a bunch of stuff going on here, but there's a very big conflict between two wings of the Black Liberation Movement after uh, the Civil War in Reconstruction. And that conflict, at least in the story we're looking at, is um, is uh, illuminated by the fight between John R. Lynch and H.P. Jacobs. Now, very interestingly. H.P. Jacobs will come up to Ypsilanti all the time. You know, uh, it's not a one-off. He can, he retains his relationship with Ypsilanti, even though he's living in the South and working in the South uh, for the rest of his life. His daughters will return to Ypsilanti, and many of them will live here the re and grow, have their families here for the rest of their lives. The, his last daughter dying in Adrian, Michigan in 1952. So there are people alive in this area today who knew H.P. Jacobs' family. Um, uh, but very interestingly, John R. Lynch also comes all the way from Mississippi to Ypsilanti many times to speak. And I can't help but think that what we're seeing there is also, is also part of that rivalry between Jacobs and Lynch. And it, it takes place both in Mississippi and even in Ypsilanti, even in Ypsilanti. 
Okay, so suffrage debates. This is um, the remarkable Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. She was probably the most, I would say that I, uh, you could make a case that she was the most well-known black woman writer of her generation. She was a poet, uh, she was an abolitionist, she was a feminist, uh, a fighter for black liberation, a fighter for women's liberation, uh, a remarkable person. She also led, um, after John Brown and John Brown's men were killed, were executed or died at Harper's Ferry, she led a group of women who uh, raised money for the rest of their lives to take care of the orphans of Harper's Ferry. So she would become friends with John Brown's widow, um, uh, Mary Brown, uh, and have a long-term relationship with them about because she raised money for the families. And so she comes to Ypsilanti to Brown Chapel in 1874 for a rally. And, oh, sorry about that. And here's the rally. It's a rally for equal rights. Equal rights demand the women vote. Mrs. Harper, the distinguished color woman order of America will speak at the Methodist Episcopal African Church in this city, the corner of Buffalo and Adam Street tomorrow meeting evening. Her subject will be the relations of the colored women of this country to the government under which they live, their rights and needs. We are glad that our colored friends are getting alive to this qu great question, the cause of Christ, of a redeemed and regenerated humanity. And who's going to speak at this? Professor Estabrook, who is a uh, white professor from Eastern Michigan University. Look who's there. C. A. S. H. Wells, the man who denounced um, Lyman Norris, the black barber and member of the 55th Massachusetts, is now going to fight for women's rights. Every colored man and woman felt the full force of her remarks as she portrayed how, when the dark shadow of slavery rested upon them, they mutually suffered. Oh, I went away. <laughs> they mutually suffered. And let me, uh, now being free, the justice and necessity of both clinging and rising together. So, uh, uh, the reconstruction, even for black men to get the right to vote, and that's then you use that right to fight for our rights as well, right? You you only gain that right if you can use it to exp you know it's only worth something if you're going to use it to expand the rights of others as well. Uh, and so this is 1874 that we see uh, black Ypsilanti demanding women have the right to vote. This is at the most important black institution of Ypsilanti at the time, Brown Chapel AME Church. This is not a sidelight. This is this a central thing. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper is a major figure. And so we have black Ypsilanti supporting women's right to vote in 1874. It will take another yeah, I'm gonna. I'm trying to do the math in my head, but uh, over 40 years, over 40 years before women in Michigan would get the right to vote. Frederick Douglass speaks in Ypsilanti. He spoke three times in Ypsilanti in 1866, and here's where he spoke. Here's Hewitt Hall. This is the mix right there, um, and you can see the third floor is now gone, right? And it actually used to be a roller rink and all kinds of stuff, but it was a major theater. It was also the first place where Uncle Tom's Cabin was performed in Michigan, right there. Uh, and you see that Frederick Douglass will speak at Hewitt Hall Thursday evening, May 17th, 1866, and his talk is The, Le the Assassination and Its Lesson. So here he is speaking on Lincoln's assassination in 1866, and, and look at how much seats are. A reserved seat is 50 cents. So Frederick Douglass is getting as much, uh, he, he is a major draw. I don't think many people in the United States speaking that time would get 50 cents for a speech. Uh, so he is a major, major draw. He, I mean, that's it's like spending $200 to go to a concert or something. It's not quite that, but it, it's 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 not cheap. Uh, to, to go see him there. Um, and then he comes back the year later and he gives the talk a remarkable talk. And if you want to do some homework tonight, go look for this talk by Frederick Douglass. Uh, it's called The Perils of the Republic. And uh, if you notice that date, that is Martin Luther King Day. It's also Inauguration Day. And so a few years ago when Trump was inaugurated, it fell on that date. And the Frederick Douglass is giving a speech, The Perils of the Republic, to, of the Republic, which is a complicated, long, detailed, deep, politically powerful speech um, on the dangers of an incompetent racist as president. 
Uh, and uh, it's a powerful, powerful speech. And uh, we're, we were lucky that we were able um, to have Ypsilanti High School students memorize that speech for the anniversary a couple of years ago and celebrate the speech that Douglas gave on that day on the anniversary by reciting it. In 1888, so 20 years later, Douglas comes back to Ypsilanti. He'll speak at the Opera House. That's gone by then. Or that's a, a different um, setup in the, uh, Hewitt Hall by then. And it's a very different speech. So the first two speeches are sort of revolutionary speeches. They're speeches about um, reconstructing society, not just the government. Uh, uh, they're speeches about uh, expanding rights. In 1888, again, Frederick Douglass is very old at this point. The speech is mainly, please continue to support the Republican Party, even though they haven't done anything for you for the last 10 years. And so it's a very different speech. Um, uh, uh, Douglass is a Republican. He will be a Republican his whole life. Uh, and he will come to Ypsilanti because Ypsilanti has an important Black population to encourage them to continue supporting a party that does not support them anymore. And so let's look, let's see. So snapshots of social life in that, um, in that period after reconstruction where we still, we have uh, the ability of, uh, a, a greater ability, especially of black men, if not women, to move in society, to organize in society, to be political, to be economic actors in society, right? But at the same time, we still have a, a social constriction and a racial constriction, which makes full integration and participation absolutely impossible. So you see an explosion of black self-organizations. You see an explosion of black um, uh, community organizing, everything from mutual benefit associations, which would pool the resources of Black families together to buy property so they didn't have to go through white bankers to, uh, uh, you know, to bury you at Highland Cemetery. Uh, so you had those mutual benefit associations. You had groups like the Free, the Black um, Masonic Lodge, the Prince Hall Masons. You had women setting up uh, Lyceum uh, uh, reading groups in their in their homes. So let's just look at a couple of the, the, I think this is because, you know, we're talking about the politics and the legal stuff, but this is the life that people live in. This is, this is what they're creating out of the civil war. They are creating a black world, uh, you know, in conflict and contest with each other and with white people uh, and with the state and all kinds of stuff, but they are creating a world that, that did not exist before or did not, wasn't fully formed before. So the colored folks held, and again, this is these are from the time, so I'm just going to read them as they're written. The colored folks held a church social at Batch Elders Hall Christmas night. Batch Elders Hall would have been across from where kind of Beezy's is today on North Washington. About 12 o'clock, some drunken rowdy came there and succeeded getting up a row by being too intimate with some of the young ladies. As a natural consequence, he got a chair smashed over his head, which led to things, a state of confusion, a pretty bright, a lively breakup of the social. So, you know, uh, sometimes things don't go as planned. I, You know, I think it's important to remember that that this is also a working class community. It's a rough and tumble community, like any working class community, right? It's, 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 and it's divided within itself between it, its, you know, um, tea drinking lyceum leaders and it's more rough and tumble chair breakers, just like every community, right? It has all of that in it. Uh, uh, it has S.H. Wells. Here's our oldest barber in our city. Has sold out to Mr. Butler. His partner, Mr. Wells, leaves next week for California. Goodbye, Wells. May your old time friends will miss you. Again, the ability to move and, you know, uh, he's a barber, so he owns a business. So he's not, he's, he's exceptional in many ways. But now Wells has the ability to move in the landscape. He will actually move to Denver, Colorado, where he will live for the rest of his life. His, his wife will die in Colorado, but want to be buried in Ypsilanti. So she's buried all the way back here at Highland Cemetery, and he will become a major Black leader in Denver, Colorado, at the end of his life, and even uh, publish a Black newspaper in Denver, Colorado. So if we could ever, we have a connection to Denver here in Ypsilanti. Here you have the Hart uh, Lodge number two. So uh, Ypsilanti has a very, very early Prince Hall Black Masonic Lodge. And if we look at all the names here, these are all Black Civil War veterans. Uh, 
right? So that civil war experience created relationships in the political alliances and social relationships and marriages and all of that kind of stuff that would last the rest of people's lives and deeply impact politics and social life in Ypsilanti. Those civil war relationships really are key to everything moving forward. The Second Baptist Church of this city will hold a basket meeting at the fairgrounds next Saturday, preaching at 1030 a.m. and 3 p.m. Reverend J.L. Cheney and Reverend Johnson, pastor of the church, will be present. Uh, a mission is taken uh, at the gate is free. A collection will be taken for the benefit of the church. So uh, the fairgrounds, where is that? That's Recreation Park. Recreation Park was always a uh, a park in which Black people had access to. It is, but if you know, you know anybody on the call probably knows Ypsilanti knows Recreation Park is between North and South Ypsilanti. And when Park Ridge was created on the South side of Ypsilanti, there was a real resentment because Black people had been going to Recreation Park for years, for generations, and now Ypsilanti was saying, "But you want a park of your own, don't you?" Uh, and and so um, there was actually a demand on Black Ypsilanti to not build Park Ridge because they knew it was a, a move to segregate them when they had already been going to Recreation Park for years. Now, then we get Brown v. Board in 1954, right? 54. And then uh, uh, that will also change and Ypsilanti will celebrate, even invite the local news to take pictures of Black and white children uh, spending time together at Recreation Park. But again, I think it's important to remember in Reconstruction, Black people went to Recreation Park. In the 1940s, you went to Park Ridge. Things did not get better in some ways. The Colored Masons throughout the state will hold their annual banquet in the city next Monday. So all the Black Masons from all over the state are coming to Ypsilanti. Uh, um, uh, Mr. H. Davis, son of Mr. James Davis, who was with Cell Circus, made a complete record of the travels of the same and of the towns they visited. Met, the circus was the way you got out of town. You know, when we're thinking of now, like, how am I going to get out of this little podunk town and make it big and stuff like that? And people have their dreams. And one of the ways you did that back then was the circus. Um, and uh, uh, Black men had a niche within circus bands. So in fact, the black the band of the United States color troops led by Thomas Rodman would become the band of Cell Circus, more or less. A lot of jazz music comes out of this period because at the end of the Civil War, all the marching bands um, uh, uh, threw away their, you know, a marching band has different kinds of instruments. If you're doing the, you know, it goes behind you, right? It doesn't go in front of you. And so there were tons of marching band instruments that were lying around and they were picked up by black folks and turned into what became jazz uh, later. So, you know, even things that we, even those, those kinds of connections so deep, the American art form, jazz, in part has its roots in this period as well. Here we have the Colored Regiment uh, uh, reunion uh, at the fifth. And what are they? What are they remembering? They're not remembering the Emancipation Proclamation. They're not remembering the Civil War. They're remembering what was important to this community. And it's not. It's not um, Juneteenth. It's August first. 1930 or 1834. It's Emancipation Day. It's Canada. So that's when the USCT gets together here. And look who speaks at it. Major John, or Major Martin R. Delaney, uh, and John O'Hara, who's a Southern Reconstruction Congressperson. And then you can look at all of these names of, of the people participating in this. So let's see the fifth. So that is in 1884. So remember, Martin Delaney was here in 1863, right? He's here again in 1884. Ypsilanti's Black community is a center of Black life in this area for many, many years. This uh, this reunion we're looking at is actually held in Ann Arbor and it's held at Relief Park in Ann Arbor. Okay, and I know I need to hurry up. So the end of Reconstruction. So uh, many, many, many things happen to end Reconstruction. Um, uh, and we can't go into all of them. In fact, we're still living in the end of Reconstruction in some ways. Um, you get a shift in national politics. You get an end of the Civil War alliances. The West, people moving West. So, you know, you talk about North and South, and now you've got an entirely new 
uh, geographic demographic sort of way to understand the country and that's east west right um, you get uh, uh, a change in labor you get the mass industrialization the growth of cities you get an immigration that's very different after the civil war than before the civil war before the civil war with a few exceptions the irish uh, immigration was largely a, an entrepreneurial immigration it was to come here to make yourself better or whatever to speculate to own a business to own a farm and and immigration after the civil war became increasingly associated with providing labor for industry so it wasn't about bettering your you, people you you were literally hired in poland to come work in chicago at a at a, a steel mill and so you know so immigration changes the character and the people coming changes so that the people also doing the work, it's not any longer what is white is changing. Are Italians white? Are, are Spanish people white? Are Greek people white? Are, you know, all of that kind of thing is getting worked out in this process. Imperialism is really important. This, the late 1880s and 1890s is when we get, is when Jeff, Thomas Jefferson's biological determinist ideas on race get codified into Darwinism or by Darwinism. So you get a non-religious, biological, scientific racism, uh, uh, which categorizes people. We didn't have that before. You had a religious racism or a cultural racism. And now there's people are saying, no, it's actually, it's, it's like genes. Uh, we're moving back to that, unfortunately, in our period now. Um, but that that exploded in the 1890s. So um, the one drop rule became manifestly important in that period. Uh, the local black population is large enough to make institutional segregation possible. I think that's really important. So Ypsilanti has 15 or 20 percent African-American population. Uh, if you if you're a racist white person and want to segregate and don't want to go to school with black people, you can create an independent school for black people. If you're in Eaton Rapids and there's and you'd like to do that, but there's just two black families, it's very hard to do, right? So the weight of Ypsilanti's black population makes segregated institutions much more viable. And so we get full segregation here be, in part because of that, that, that there's a population, enough population to have full, including a full business district, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. You see a noticeable shift in language among whites here. And I, one of the things is I've looked at so many newspapers and the shift between, say, 1870 and 1880 about how even progressive newspapers talk about race is dramatic, is dramatic. Uh, so in the 1870s, it might have been paternalistically racist, but at least it was saying, and we're all brothers or, you know, something like that. At the end of that, Black people are only being talked about in the crime reports, right? And and so even the radical progressive white paper in Ypsilanti will become a crime report paper for black people. It's virtually impossible to find black people, even though 20% of black population of Ipsy is black. It's virtually impossible to find black people in Ypsilanti's press unless it's in the crime reports. You have to go to the black press of Pittsburgh to read about Ypsilanti's black population. Um, uh, again, uh, the, the many people, uh, Ypsilanti's Black community is also changing. So most Black Ypsilantians are before and immediately after the Civil War would have had many more connections to the North, either Canada or family in New Jersey or something like that, than they would have had to the South. That begins to change. We often talk about the Great Migration beginning around 1910 or so in Ypsilanti. I'm going to say it's going to begin 20 years earlier than that. I think the Great Migration and people moving south into Ypsilanti begins about 1890. You start noticing that. So it, Ypsilanti, it happens maybe earlier than other places, but I think that's probably indicative of a larger trend that we're just not quite seeing. The other thing is that uh, uh, just like in the larger community where people are moving from the countryside and the farms are kind of clearing out and it's becoming agribusiness and, you know, you, you don't need 30 people to bring in the harvest anymore. You just need one. Uh, uh, and so people are moving off of the land into the cities. And where is the rural land around here where black people live? It's Canada. And what is the local city that they would move to? Ypsilanti. So you see a lot of people coming from Canada to Ypsilanti. 
Uh, you, we might think of it as returning to the United States, but this is just one community uh, uh, that has developed between Canada and the United States. So really think of it as people moving from the country to the city. And this is the black city that people feel comfortable moving to. There are educational opportunities at uh, in Ypsilanti for black people. The Michigan Normal School will hire or will uh, even though H.P. Jacobs' uh, daughters were the first, uh, they will hire or they will, Black women especially have access to go to be teachers here because it's a teaching school. And uh, you, um, for, for in a segregated school system, the only job available to a Black woman is, uh, is teaching in a segregated school system. It's either that or, or you know, washing the dishes. And so um, one of the issues about segregation in, is in Ypsilanti is that be, to be those black women, if they're gonna be taught to be teachers, will not be taught to be teachers in front of white students. That's not gonna be allowed, right? So it requires to be able to teach black teachers at the Michigan Normal College. It requires a black school to be able to do that. So progressive liberal Eastern Michigan University to be able to teach black teachers kept segregation going in this town for generations after it was supposed to. So uh, if there's one institution that propped up segregated schooling more than any other institution in this town, it was what is now Eastern Michigan University. I wish they would put up their hand and admit to that. And it's the reason is that I'm talking about now. They were using Black Ypsilanti School as a training school for Black teachers, more or less. Uh, there's also the racism of segregation that everybody supported. But I think that's important, you know, when we're talking about how segregation works, it's an institution. One cannot get away from it. Slavery was an institution. One cannot get away from it. So how are you going to react to it? And this is how progressive Ypsilanti reacted to it. The way to deal with the abomination of segregation was to keep it going because that was the only way to teach black teachers to teach black students so you see the dilemma you're trapped in this thing we need to break out of these traps okay uh, uh established churches and schools provide an anchor for a growing community so ypsilanti and ann arbor both have two pre-civil war black churches if i told you celine had two black churches in the 1870s i'm sure you would be surprised but celine also had two black churches in the 1870s one lasted only a brief time one a much longer period but any time i travel through a community or, or or looking at the history of a community in the north and they have a black church that predates the civil war that's an important black community there's that's the, that's what <laughs> that's what illumin and that's what uh, uh, set me off on kind of Ypsilanti. Wait a minute, there are black churches here from before the Civil War. That means something, right? That means something. Uh, and so both Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor have that. And so you have a long tradition of activism, of political uh, ac activity, of organizing. Reconstruction is not. The birth of organizing it's where you're putting all of your skills and talents and stuff you've learned over the last 30 or 40 years in into a new context so the isolation from community and legislative pro, uh, politics becomes more and more so it used to be in the 1870s that more or less the republican party in ypsilanti was black and white uh and then by about the 1880s i mean and the leadership of it. Now, that doesn't mean that black people ran for office, but in the party leadership to keep black people on side with the Republican Party, and also because people genuinely supported that alliance, uh, um, black people were in certain positions of real leadership within the party. Again, not within government, not within politics, but within the party here in Ypsilanti. Now, that will change. So it goes from OK, you can't run, but you can at least have power within the party to, OK, you can't run and now you can't have power in the party, but you can vote for us. That's the you know, that's the, the step down. And so what you do see is a lot of black people moving to the only non-racist party in Ips, in the Ipsy area at that time. Uh, which is the prohibition party so um you see many leading black 
activists from the 1880s who were Republicans becoming prohibitionist party people, because that's the vehicle for which they can fight for civil rights, et cetera. So James H. Kersey will actually run for mayor of Ypsilanti as a black man on the prohibition ticket. He will not get elected, he will not get elected. Uh, so you see here, I want to, you to look at these two. Remember how I was saying how, how differently the press talked about black people. So this is the same press. This is the Ypsilanti commercial. And the first one here is from the 1860s. And the two, just the tones of them are so different. So listen to the first one. Ungentlemanly, a colored man was standing on the sidewalk in front of Cross's store Tuesday when a man in a soldier's uniform slapped him in the face without any provocation whatsoever, so far as we can, but simply because the assailed uh, has a darker skin than his own. The colored man reacted, uh, resented the indignity, and his assailer was completed to a visit, a visit to the surgeon. Serves him right. The newspaper said it was right for the black man to beat this white man. Wait, what? <laughs> We deprecate into uh, the uh, excuses of the soldiers, whether it be sacking of copperhead presses, so-called, or whether it be as the uh, assailing of a defenseless colored man, all wrong. In every instance, the assailant ought to be subjected to the full penalty of the law. We're happy to say that these dangerous ex excuses are not, excesses are not countenanced by the better class of our soldiers, but in every instance due to bad whiskey, working upon the brains, badly needed, regenerated grace of the gospel to make them better men. But so this actually defends the black man for hitting a white white man. There will be a long time before the, the white press of Ypsilanti will defend any black man for hitting a white man. So they will want a separate jail. This is 30 years later. Ypsilanti, and again, I apologize for the tone of the article. I'm reading a historic piece. Ypsilanti has a surplus of colored population, surplus, and they are taking steps to draw the color line. They have schools for colored people and churches, but no race rum shops. They have been compelled to mix with the low whites. Remember how class and race works. White people are low if they mix with black people, right? And black people are low if they mix with low whites, right? Race, race and class, they, they work together. They work together. Uh, uh, mix with low whites every time they wish to have mix their drinks. They have taken steps to purchase a drink shop from one of the dealers there and will have a rum hole presided over by a son of ham. The chairs will be painted white, the counter will be ebony, and the tables black walnut. In this way, they sit on the white and lean on the black. A banjo will hang on the two sides of the room, an oil painting of possums and a map of Africa or door on the other sides. The principal mixed drink will be the black strap, a statue of Booker T. Washington, and another of Blanche K. Bruce, a Reconstruction leader from the South, will stand on the cigar case and Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation decorated with the American flag will be suspended from the center of the ceiling. The gallery for shooting craps will be located in the well. That's giving away dark secrets within a free month, three months enterprising colored citizens will be asking for a private jail for their race recognition only. Look at the total change. This is the same newspaper. The total, so it's a Republican newspaper. This is not a Democratic newspaper. The total change in attitude. Uh, one of being respectful, if if paternalistic, and um, talking down to, but at least respectful. The other one, utterly disrespectful. To Blanche K. Bruce, who's a who was a uh, senator in the U.S. Senate. You know, most white people, <laughs> well, anyway. Okay, so that's the end of Reconstruction. That Those shaken alliances, that sh the, the alliance which won the Civil War falls, falls. So for Constable of the First District to appease the wrath of the color vote who claimed to have been counted out in the caucus, remember how I said, you know, you have to count us in, one, Arthur D. Jones was nominated for constable. So, you, you know, uh, we have that history of reconstruction of Black uh, participation in Ypsilanti. And so we have a, a veneer of it continuing, even though the reality uh, isn't. Here you see, um, here's that John R. Lynch. Remember him that we talked about earlier? Here he's speaking in Ypsilanti. You see the only colored Greeleyite in town, and we, we don't have time to go into that, but that's very interesting. So how strongly that this country or this city was strongly pro-Republican. You first ward Republican choose Negro and then failed to ratify the result. 
uh, R. H. Morton, who's a, a Richard Dick Morton, was a, a black man here. Color line is drawn at Ward Caucus in Big ne Negro Ward. So even on the South Side in the first ward, the Republicans uh, would not. Uh, um, uh, their own constituency in the first ward was black people, not white people, and they they rebuffed their own constituency. So James Kersey, candidate and alderman in the first ward on the prohibition ticket, was born in 1859. He attended school in Ypsilanti and has been a resident of Ypsilanti for 24 years. So that's James H. Kersey. And then here we have, this is the Grand Army of the Republic marching, and it was the, it was supposed to be desegregated and if you see here there is one black man marching and that is john anderson right here john anderson has a special relationship with the gar here so the grand army of the republic was supposed to be integrated for all civil war soldiers they met on pearl street uh eventually they didn't they didn't make a formal decision they asked for the good of relationships in ypsilanti if black people would withdraw from the gar and black people i don't know how they made the decision, but black Ypsilantian soldiers then go into Detroit to be members of the John Brown uh, Grand Army of the Republic Lodge. So uh, literally the lodge is on Pearl Street. If you want to participate as a black man from Ypsilanti, you have to go to Detroit now. So so what was a a a the first mass integrated organization in American history, the Grand Army of the Republic, has now gotten segregated even in Ypsilanti. That's how far we have fallen. Jim Crow really does happen in Ypsilanti. It is sanctioned. Uh, unlike the South, it's a civic segregation. So it is not, it is not enforced largely uh, by mass violence. There's individual violence. There's individual intimidation. Occasionally, there are hints of greater violence. I know that um, in the eight, late 1880s, there was certainly uh, not physical violence directed at black people, but at black homes in Depot Town, in which a number of black uh, homes were burnt out to try to get black people to remove from Depot Town. So it wasn't just sort of peaceful segregation. There was the threat of violence was ever present behind it. But unlike the South, you know, we come close to a couple of lynchings, I believe in 1931, it was both a white and black man who were going to get attacked here. Uh, but we've never had things like that here in the South uh, that happened in the South. And I think that is important to remember because um, that mass violence, uh, that takes it to a different level, right? That, that, that's a, uh, that is an ongoing civil war. That's what that is. That's not, that is a, 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 a war um, and, and it has a different kind of connotation. But that being said, the neighborhoods become increasingly divided. Uh, we'll look at this in a moment, but the vast majority of black Ypsilanti will move to the first ward by 1890. Again, in 1850s, at least in terms of where you lived, Ypsilanti was far less segregated than it is to this day. Uh, segregation is employment becomes really important. And remember how we were talking about immigration and change in work and uh, the fact that Ypsilanti has a large black working class population, means that heavy industry is going to move to Ypsilanti to take advantage of that uh, working class or that work population and, and, and foundry industry because black men had niches in industry. So Ypsilanti transforms from a college town to a working class industrial town largely in this period and it is on the basis of black labor and the racial divisions in black labor so u.s press steel which is now where the ford plant is on 94 would have been mostly black uh workers and then central specialty which is where um the corner brewery is now both of those massive plants with hundreds of people working in them would have been largely black uh, male workers in there. And you don't see anything like that in Ypsilanti. Or, in fact, Detroit until later, until Ford opens the Rouge plant. Uh, segregation in private business and social clubs, including theaters, diners, saloons, hotels, and some stores. So what was not segregated will now be segregated. So the color line will be drawn right so in some places that color line was always there and now they're going to make it official in other places that color line was not there and they're going to draw it for the first time so we see color line drawn in bowling this is where smarty cats is 
um, uh, and uh, that's an absolute beautiful example of how segregation and racism worked in Ypsilanti. So Mayor Dawson, uh, at, at the bowling alley, there was a sign placed up saying no black people. I'm not sure exactly what the sign said, but it said to affect no black people. That is against the law in Michigan to do that by the 1880s. We saw the Supreme Court decision. And so black Ypsilanti complains about the sign at the bowling alley and the mayor goes up to talk to the owner of the bowling alley and convinces him to take the sign down but the color line will be drawn nonetheless. So we're not rude like the South and have big signs and all, you know, and beach, but we still have the color line, everyone. Absolutely, we still have the color line. Um, uh, it's openly discussed and debated. You know, these are the front pages of the newspaper. This is not, people are not hiding behind these discussions. They're not embarrassed about having these discussions. You have the mayor of Ypsilanti showing up in blackface to public events. They are not embarrassed about this. Um, you know, I think we need to take them at their word. They really meant it. They really meant it. Um, in the 18, uh, there's consistent resistance. Uh, there is, this is before the NAACP is ever born. Uh, in reconstruction period, you see most black people try to fight with through the Republican party and the institutions of the Republican party for civil rights. After the, the, that alliance breaks down, you see independent black civil rights organizations growing up. So you see the Afro-American League, um, the Equal Rights League, the Anti-Lynching Leagues. All of these will have people living in Ypsilanti and participating in them 30 years before, 20 years before the NAACP is even formed. So I think that's really important to remember is when black when access was closed down within the Republican Party to to uh, influencing, if not if not determining, to influencing legal protections, et cetera. You created your own institutions, your civil rights, and fought on that basis, right? So there was never a withdrawal. There was never a retreat. A retreat. It's fighting on different in different arenas with different weapons, different different uh, tools. So many of you have seen this before. This is Ypsilanti's black. Uh, racial landscape. And just to show you here, these are the five wards of Ypsilanti, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. In 1860, Ypsilanti's Black population is spread around Ypsilanti. 25% of the Black population lives in the first ward. Seven lives in the small ward around downtown. Uh, 36 lives in the third ward, so where kind of campus is. 10%, uh, the fourth ward, where Depot Town is. 20% the fifth ward kind of south of Michigan Avenue on the east side. So again, not a single place has a majority of black people, let alone all of the black people, right? It, it, black people are living, now this doesn't mean Ypsilanti was holding hands and singing Kumbaya in the 1860s, but it does mean that black people and white people were physically less segregated, at least in terms of housing, by far less segregated than they are today. By a factor of 100 to 1, because as you see, what happens is by 1920, 93.6 of all Black Ypsilantians will live in the first ward. And one of the things I want you to see, remember when I was talking about Depot Town? That's Ward, uh, that's ward 4. In 1880, 5% of Ward 4, or 5% of Black people live in Ward 4, and you can see what happens there. So that is... There, what you're seeing there is actually um, that violent moment. And look by 1920. Uh, Depot Town, when I first moved to Ypsilanti in the early, uh, or first came to Ypsilanti in the 90s, Depot Town was a no-go area for Black people. So this, this kind of, you know, it's beginning to break a little bit now. Uh, but this thing that was set up in 1920 lasted for 100 years and continues to last. Uh, in our way now. And I think that's important to remember that these things are choices people made, right? This is not this is not some sort of organic, it just happened. There's no agency. Nobody had a decision to make. It just happened. No, Ypsilanti has changed profoundly since 1920. So many things have changed in Ypsilanti since 1920, except where black and white people live. So something, it's not that it's unchanging, it's that people keep making the same racist decisions over and over and over and over again. And I'm going to ask you, where is the new housing 
they're building an Ypsilanti largely for poor and black people going to be. Guess what? On the outskirts of town, just where they put poor and black people for the last 150 years, meaning they're making this, they can look at a map like this, they can look at these segregation and go, yep, and we're going to put black people over here, right? making the same decision over and over again is not necessarily unchanging. It is responding to changed events with the same racist attitude. And sometimes that attitude does not need to be spoken. It doesn't need to be enunciated in any way. It is part of the matrix of how this works. This highway right here, when people were deciding to put down that highway, I guarantee nobody even had to think in their mind, should it go through Barton Hills? That never showed up in somebody's mind, Barton Hills, right? So they didn't even have to think that rich white people were, were, were not going to remove them because they knew that before they even started, right? Didn't even have to think about it. Okay, um, I love this. Some of you have seen this before. We're going to be wrapping up here shortly. I love this. This is the Ladies Literary Club, and they are deciding, shall we draw the color line? Now, no Black women have ever were ever members of the Ladies Literary Club, but the Literary Club is deciding on its own that they're going to draw the color line. And then I wish I knew her name. I wish I knew her name. This Black woman writes in response to this, in, this is 1901. A colored woman from the city writes as follows to the editor regarding the recent discussion of the Ladies Literary Club as to whether or not the Federation of Women's Club should draw the color line. Remember what we've been talking about, this community, where it came from, how it organized, uh, the, the things it had to confront, how it continued to organize in changing circumstances. And she writes to them, before you draw the color line, I think it well to call a meeting to see if the colored ladies would take care to join with the white women or not in their women clubs. I don't think that, uh, that uh, there is one of the colored ladies who has asked you if they could become a member of your club. The colored ladies have a society of their own and they don't consult the white ladies about it. And don't ask them to become members. The colored people of Ypsilanti have made themselves, right? So that is the black response to the uh, the middle class white ladies at the ladies literary club deciding whether they should formally not have black people there or not. And I think that says a lot, one, about the white community and how myopic they are to the reality of their black neighbors, and two, how politically astute, confident, organized, and uh, a tradition that black Ypsilanti had. Okay. Early civil rights organizations. Here's a couple of leaders. This is Herman Kersey and this is Paul Clay. There may be Kersey's and Clay, Clay's on here. But then, again, these are all pre-Civil War or pre-NAACP civil rights organizations or coming up to the NAACP. Alfred Anderson, do you remember me showing you the black man who was marching with the GAAR? Uh, John Anderson, his son, is the first head of the NAACP. You see Alfred Anderson on Sunday evening um, uh, he discussed at the Methodist Church on behalf of the National Association of Colored People. The organization has headquarters in New York City and is planning a two weeks membership drive. Very, very early. It's like he has a very, very early NAACP. P chapter. The Colored Welfare League of Washington County is making elaborate plans for reception uh, to be given at the Ann Arbor Masonic Temple Thursday evening. Uh, as free and all colored people of the county are expected to be present, the league expects for long to have a community home of their own. They have in mind to purchase the building at 211 North 4th in Ann Arbor. The Washington County Protective League, which is what it says, it's a protective league, met at the Good Samaritan Hall, which is still here in Ypsilanti on the corner of Buffalo and South Adams. Uh, Tuesday evening, April 15th, an elected Reverend W.L. Brown, President Arthur Jones, having resigned. It's now the opinion of all the leaguers. We now have the right man in the right place to do the job. Uh, the district in the coming convention to be held in Detroit. And here's the 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 local people who are uh, involved in it. You see James Kersey again, the merchant family. Look who comes. William Monroe Trotter from Boston, the National Equal Rights League Trotter House in Ann Arbor is named after him. He's a radical rival to Du Bois's. Uh, uh, he's gonna be speaking at the AME Church, the African uh, Afro-American League um, uh, uh, meets here. Uh, and if you notice that Joe Pettiford, uh, L.W. Lewis uh, and J.W. Parson of Ann Arbor there, 
and then uh, uh, ask for an injunction against the school board. So the schools that we demanded to have access and control over are black schools that were uh, signs of our self-determination and independence have become an albatross around our neck. And we want an end to segregated schooling in Ypsilanti. So two, two, let's, we'll end with two short stories. One is Ypsilanti in the 1890s. And again, we are now in the nadir, the worst part of the failure of reconstruction, that biological racism, mass violence in the South, uh, reconstruction has been overturned in every Southern state, except maybe North Carolina, and it's about to be overturned in North Carolina in a couple of months. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's a dark, dark, dark period uh, uh, for race relations and for black position in the United States. And in, in that period, James Eaton was arrested, uh, who was charged with murder in Ypsilanti. Now, who is James Eaton? James Eaton is a police officer. Who is he charged with murdering? He was charged with, with murdering a man named Jake Griffith, a black man in police custody. So a white police officer was charged in the 1890s and brought to trial for the murder of a black man in custody. That is extraordinarily hard to do today. We, we've we had an uprising in this country a couple of years ago because of how hard it is to do today. In the 1890s, virtually impossible. And Ypsilanti, you notice here, this is the um, this is the Good Samaritan Hall or the Prince Hall Masonic Lodge on uh, South Adams and uh, Buffalo. Uh, and this is where the meeting was happened, an indignation meeting. They were called indignation meeting. Imagine two or three hundred people in this hall demanding that uh, Officer Eaton be arrested and charged with murdering of, of Griffith, uh, and they're able to do that. And Ypsilanti is considered so racist, and the 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 um, the lawyer who comes in to help uh, Ypsilanti is uh, Straker from Detroit, so a major figure in black uh, law and black politics, and not just Michigan but nationally, uh, comes in to help. And because Ypsilanti is considered so racist. They have to move the trial to another less racist town. And that town, believe it or not, is going to be South Lyons. So if you've ever been to South Lyons, South Lyons had the reputation of being a less racist town than Ypsilanti. Now, Ypsilanti has the reputation now of being a very, very progressive town. And we tend to read that backwards. But again, Black people thought South Lyons was less racist than Ypsilanti in, in, in 1890. Now, Officer Eaton was acquitted. We knew that was going to happen, and he's hired back in to the police, Ypsilanti police force. But we had it, it's astounding that he was brought to trial and 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 went all the way through the trial. And then when he's brought back uh, uh, in on to um, the police force, there's a constant attempt to hold him to account on the part of black people. And sometimes it's legal, and sometimes it's almost a riot. Ypsilanti's uh, long, hot summer was 1893, not 1963, and it was in the aftermath of, of uh, Griffith's murder and the acquittal of James Eaton, um, uh, when there was quite a bit of friction and probably the most racial violence in Ypsilanti up until the 1960s. Okay. And then quickly, I want to tell the story of the the desegregation of the high school uh, or the uh, the school. And um, if anybody's seen the, the what used to be the senior center on Cross Street, that was built in 1915 as the new high school. And that's when they were building consolidated schools and schooling was changing very dramatically in that period where you went from the one room schoolhouse to the technical college and the high school and all of that. So schools are changing. There wasn't really a a high school the way we would think of it before in Ypsilanti, in which everybody would go to. If you were a working class person, you didn't go to high school, black or white. You you know, you, you quit after maybe ninth grade if you were lucky. None of my grandparents went to high school. I'm sure a lot of you, none of your grandparents went to high school. So going to high school was not necessarily, a, you know, it's a, it's a class thing as well as a race thing, but only six black people graduated from Ypsilanti High School between 1890 and in, in about 20 years, right? So uh, very, very few black people in Ypsilanti would have graduated from high school. Now you could, it was even more likely in fact, that you would go to the normal school than you would to Ypsilanti High School. 
So more black people would have gotten their higher education at what is now Eastern Michigan University than Ypsilanti High School. Okay, so at the same time, they are building this brand new, beautiful school for white Ypsilanti, the, this new high school, that Ypsilanti school that they've had since the Civil War on the South Side, the South Side has had since the Civil War in the First Ward, the Adams Street School, the roof is falling in, the, there's no heat, there's no plumbing. So you have a black teacher and a black principal, but you don't have any books. So self-determination without resources is not, when somebody else controls the resources, is not self-determination, right? And so um, what you get is a demand uh, by Herman Kersey and, and Paul Clay and other people, Bernice Kersey, to uh, to go to the high school, say, no, we want to go to the high school. And the the city responds, the school department responds by going, yes, the school isn't, your school isn't a mess. We'll put forward a bond to build you a new school. And so a bond goes in into people are going to vote on the bond in an election. And uh, Black Ypsilanti organizes against the bond for that school because that Herman Kersey, as he writes, we're not, we don't want a new school. We want to go to the school you just built. We want to go to where the resources are, where white people are, where your children are, is where the resources will be. That's where we want to go. We don't want to be denied the resources of the, we pay taxes too. We pay taxes too. And so, um, Ypsilanti was, uh, Black Ypsilanti was able to get that uh, uh, bond turned down. And then what happens is uh, Ypsilanti brings in Robert Bagnell, Black Ypsilanti brings in Robert Bagnell and Charles Mahoney, who would go on to be major figures in the M NAACP. Charles Mahoney will be the lead Black lawyer on the Ocean Suite case in Detroit in 1925. And they use Michigan's 1886 civil rights law to bring uh, Ypsilanti to court. And in 1919, uh, Herman Kersey and uh, Black Ypsilanti is able to win in court. So in 1919, Ypsilanti's proposed school, a uh, 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 segregated school, is closed down. Now, again, this is 1919. Remember what we were saying? 1890s? This is That's the red summer of 1919. That's when East St. Louis, 100 Black people are killed in a pogrom. Chicago, that's really intense racial violence, racist reaction in this country. The red summer of 1919. And uh, and uh, Herman Kersey and uh, the lawyers from the NAACP in uh, 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 Herman's or I don't remember his first name Sample Judge Sample's court uh, in Washington County was able to get the first ward school closed as a school built just for black people for segregation. So they were able to appeal not to the U.S. civil rights laws but to Michigan civil rights laws to do that. Okay. And then here's our coda. So what happened after that? Here is the last picture of Ypsilanti's segregated school system. And there's Bernice Kersey. She's um, Herman Kersey's sister. And she would be the last teacher, black teacher, of the first word school. And I apologize. This photo is cut off. There's a bunch more people over here. So this is just half the photo. Uh, but this is the last picture here of Adams Street School. And this is the first picture here of the desegregated Harriet Street School. And Harriet Street is, is built in the 1920s and reopened as a non-segregated school. And what do you notice is the difference? Again, I, I promise you the other part, sort of this picture is very similar. The, the difference is that the teacher is white. So desegregation meant that Bernice Kersey the greatest teacher in Ypsilanti history, maybe, was denied the right to teach students because it might mean she would teach white students. Between 1919 and until she was hired by Eugene Beatty in 1949. So for 30 years, Ypsilanti denied itself access to its finest teacher because she might have taught white people. And I've actually met a few white people of a certain age who were able to have her as a teacher uh, in the 50s and 60s. And when you mention Bernice's names, their faces light up. All Everybody I've ever mentioned Bernice's face name to, their face lights up because she was that kind of teacher. Uh, she, was, she was a remarkable teacher. But if you're going to desegregate 
a school and still have racism because we didn't get rid of the racism, then you can't have a black woman potentially teaching white students. You must have a white teacher there teaching black students. So desegregation got the black teachers fired in Ypsilanti, right? So again, I want us to challenge, you know, desegregating into what? M Martin Luther King said, uh, uh, you know, we don't want to, I don't want to desegregate into a burning building, right? And, and you can't, again, segregation is an aspect of racism. It's not the reason we have racism. Racism built segregation, right? If you look at what we had, in, and then it codifies it and reinforces it, but it's not the, the reason for it. And in some cases, segregation is a progressive attempt by black people to protect their own interests. And I think that's really important to understand because that's what's at key of reconstruction. What kind of society are we going to build? What will equality look like? Because if it's just legal equality, Right. We've been going through this whole legal framework and it hasn't we haven't changed our social relations. Then that's a fiction. It's a legal equality is a fiction. And right now we have legal fictions of equality when we all know there is no equality in this country, not just between races, but men. We have the fiction of equality, but we have not yet moved to 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 equalize our society. And that will require a kind of process that looks something like the reverse of what we've just been looking at. It will require where things are built. It will require tearing down things. It will require building whole communities and not building whole communities, right? It's going to require a new reconstruction, a social reconstruction. So thank you very